In a world of modern technology, humans have prospered exponentially. But the social class system remains unchanged with the poor not being able to follow their dreams. Such is the tale of a loser boy who once dreamed of becoming a hero but his financial struggles hindered his path. However, strange phenomena start occurring in the world, presenting the boy with another chance at his dream. Our story begins with a silver-haired man standing before his bathroom mirror in confusion and questions his identity. Instead of seeing his own face in the reflection, he sees a different person staring back at him. The silver-haired man sees the ordinary guy named Lee Hoyle in his reflection, but on the other side, he is Granfell Claudi Arpeus Romeo, a character from a game Lee used to play obsessively. As he makes tea and sips it, he can't shake the feeling that he's trapped in the body of a character he created 12 years ago, back when he was just a teenager. He used to love a game, History of the Arcana Continent, but now he regrets ever making that character during his awkward middle school years. The game was his escape from the harsh reality of life until the company shut it down unexpectedly. Following the game's shutdown, strange things started happening. Monsters from the game appeared in the real world, plunging humanity into darkness. When all seemed lost, some people started developing powers like their in-game characters. They were hailed as heroes for defeating the monsters. Lee Hoyle used to be an ordinary boy who played History of the Arcana Continent but couldn't continue this VR game because of his family's poor financial condition. And after the monsters appeared in the real world, his identity as Lee Hoyle faded, and he turned into his in-game weak character Granfell. While taking his tea, Granfell can't escape the embarrassing memories of his character. Inspired by his in-game character, he turned into his grandiose delusions and started fantasizing about becoming a hero, much like Granfell Claudie. In the body of Granfell, Lee's mind lives and he worries about his character complexities and how they will play out in his real life. He worries about how he will face the day ahead at work. His boss always seems to find ways to make him feel small, and now he fears that after Granfell has taken over his body, he might do something that will get him fired. Lee worries about what to do next, while Granfell disrupts, advising him not to be weak against challenges. We learn that everything Granfell tries to say comes out differently. Lee questions if this is what it's like to merge with his in-game character, because most people felt no big difference after taking the personalities of their in-game characters. Realizing he can't work while Granfell is in control and decides to become a full-time player. But since he last played Arcana over 10 years ago, he doesn't remember much about the game. He sits down at the computer and starts searching for information on how to become a good player. He discovers that high-ranking players earn millions of in-game currency by defeating powerful enemies, but risking life and limb for money seems pointless to him. We learn that the character Granfell, who is a demon hunter class, doesn't desire material wealth since he has already experienced abundance in his in-game character story. Curious about the current state of demon hunters, he finds only two pages worth of information online. To his dismay, he learns that the town of Akshin, where players could train as demon hunters, was destroyed, wiping out all the NPCs associated with the role. However, a recent update made demons more common in the game, causing injuries to skyrocket for most of the players, even those at level 200. Lee wonders why the remaining demon hunters haven't dealt with the new threat. Perhaps he's the last demon hunter left after Akshan's destruction. Despite learning this new information in his favor, Lee still finds it difficult to take initiative because his knowledge is 10 years outweighed. He also questions whether the demons he once knew are the same ones appearing now. He reads discussions and chat logs about the addition of new demons in an update. The reality update has made demons spawn more frequently, causing difficulties even for high-level players. Lee realizes that if even the strongest players struggle against these demons, what chailments does he have? Uncertain about his role as a demon hunter in this challenging world, Lee grapples with whether he should take the lead in confronting this new threat. Despite his setback, he considers the possibility that the demons he once fought might not be the same ones causing chaos now. Despite Lee's so-called careful analysis of the new situation, Granfell, proud and unyielding, refuses to run from mere demons. No matter what temptations or taunts the demons throw at him, they will never dent the pride of Granfell. He believes it's time to take action, dismissing any thoughts of hesitation. Thousands have died because of demons, but he promises to send them back to hell. Several years have passed since the Great Cataclysm, and despite the destruction, humans have proven resilient, quickly adapting to this new world. 
However, where there is light, darkness inevitably follows, and the negative emotions of people provide sustenance for the devil and other evil beings. Granfell joins a party led by a man named Chailman. When Granfell arrives, Chailman introduces him to the group. Although they ex Chailman a greetings, Granfell's focus is on the rupture dungeon, visible only to players. The dungeon before them is considered suitable for levels 35 to 40, making a decent starting point for Granfell who is only level 55. However, the other players in most dungeons average around level 200, a level he is far from reaching. Determined to catch up, he has joined the party with players of similar level. The party introduces themselves, Seong Wook, the close-range tanker, Choi Jung Hoon, the close-range damage dealer, and Seo, the magic damage dealer. Chailman announces their plan to enter the dungeon in five minutes, allowing them time to prepare. Granfell observes the destruction progress of the rupture, which stands at 19.8%. Once it reaches 100%, monsters will be released into the real world. Only players can approach these ruptures, making it their responsibility to raid them before it's too late. Feeling glad for the friendly atmosphere, Lee decides to take control of Granfell to speak up. However, Granfell makes the words sound too formal, causing the party members to ignore him. This leaves him feeling hurt and ignored. With his pride wounded, Lee decides to remain silent, unable to endure any more of this treatment. They venture into the rupture which resembles a regular train station but with a broken appearance and scattered blood. As they reach the stairs, Jung Hoon observes the absence of signs indicating the presence of monsters. Chilman assures the party that a previous group has passed through, but they need not worry as they can simply take their share if they follow the right path. Though the party trusts Chilman's leadership, Granfell senses something amiss. They encounter some gnolls, and Chilman hastily prepares for battle. However, his impulsive charge surprises the others, who interpret it as an eagerness to fight. Granfell finds their team dynamic chaotic. The tanker is attracting monsters instead of protecting the party, and the mage is dealing the most damage despite providing support. As the battle continues, Granfell, feeling useless without suitable weapons, resolves to fight as little as possible until he finds a weapon. Suddenly, arrows rain down from the shadows, revealing countless knolls ready to attack. Granfell warns the party and the battle continues. As they struggle to defend themselves, Chaolmin abandons the group, leaving them vulnerable. Jung Hoon confronts him, but in his anger, he becomes an easy target for Knolls. Granfell swiftly eliminates the threat with an arrow. Jung Hoon, though grateful, is puzzled by Granfell's peculiar demeanor. As the party battles the monsters, two slip past and target Seo, who panics. Granfell reassures her and advises her to cast a powerful spell, even if it takes time. She follows his advice, eventually unleashing a barrage of fireballs that decimate all Knolls. Granfell brushes off concerns about himself and focuses on aiding his teammates. Observing the defeated Knolls, he wonders if he can retrieve his expensive arrow. SEO tends to the tanker's wounds, while Jong Hoon confronts Chaolman, furious about his reckless actions. Chaolman's laughter only infuriates Jong Hoon further, demanding an explanation for his behavior. Jong Hoon tells Chaolman that his behavior isn't funny at all. He mocks Chaolman saying that without his famous brother, he wouldn't be worth anything. He questions Cholman's belief in his own greatness and calls him a bastard. Suddenly, all the lights go out and Cholman finds amusement in the situation, finding it hilarious to see the party struggling before him. It's then revealed that Cholman is a demon, triggering Granfell's skill, natural enemy. Cholman mocks the party for realizing it too late, calling them extremely dumb. The party becomes affected by Chailman's skills, experiencing their worst fears. The party members see the rest of the party suffering and pleading for help, their bodies melting and their mental state deteriorating as they are overcome by fear. Chailman laughs at the sight of the humans succumbing to fear. Grandfell charges at Chailman, almost hitting him. However, Chailman warns Grandfell not to harm him, as killing him would result in the death of his host. Granfell realizes that piercing Chailman's armor is currently impossible, so he focuses on exploiting any weaknesses instead. Chailman attacks but misses, giving Granfell an opening to strike. With each attack, Granfell's natural enemy skill becomes more powerful due to Chailman's presence as a demon. Chailman, now enraged, no longer considers humans as real creatures. Despite being slashed by Granfell, 
he feels the distinct pain of being attacked with silver. When Cheolman tries to talk to Granfell, he refuses to engage in conversation with Cheolman, viewing him only as prey. As the battle intensifies, the real Cheolman reflects on how he ended up in this situation. He remembers his brother's advice to leave adventuring and become an analyst at his guild. Feeling pressure to live up to his brother's reputation, Cheolman resorted to joining forces with an imp. However, witnessing the party's struggle against Cheolman awakens a sense of responsibility within him. He screams in pain and pleads for the fighting to stop, realizing the consequences of his actions. Granfell acknowledges Cheolman's sense of pride and determination, despite the risks involved. Cheolman, desperate to protect himself, clings to the demon, prepared to face the consequences of his actions. Granfell seizes the opportunity to swiftly decapitate the imp demon. He praises Cheolman that this act has restored his pride. Later, Cheolman wakes up to find him still alive, feeling confused and shaken by the experience. Granfell reassures him and the rest of the party that they need not fear, as he is there to protect them. He explains that humans' negative emotions can empower demons, so they should remain confident and fearless. He emphasizes that a demon hunter's attacks only affect the targeted demon without harming the host. Later, Chaelman approaches his brother Taman and shows him a post about a dungeon where the party leader was possessed by an imp. His brother dismisses it as fake news, causing Chaelman to reveal that he was the party leader in the news story. This revelation surprises Taman, who is the guild master of Gaon. Chaelman explains that he wants to quit being a player and become Gaon's analyst, much to Taman's disbelief. Chaelman insists that he's serious about this decision, wanting to embrace his own path and overcome his weaknesses. Taman expresses curiosity about the person who influenced Chaelman so profoundly. He reflects on Chaelman's exceptional mentality stat and unique fighting style, wondering why he chose to enter a specific rupture despite having capabilities for more challenging ones. Chaelman acknowledges that his story sounds unbelievable, but asks Taman to trust him. Taman, having witnessed Chaelman's journey, fully trusts him, recognizing his invaluable contributions to the guild's success. He presents a contract for Chaelman to review, outlining his new role as Gaon's analyst. Chaelman, feeling overwhelmed by his brother's praise, thanks him for his kindness. Taman laughs and encourages Chaelman to review the contract. However, Chaelman becomes nervous upon reading its terms. Back at the apartment, Granfell notices a significant increase in his level which makes Lee quite happy. However, Granfell finds the increase too small to be noteworthy. Lee explains that defeating canole creatures doesn't yield many experience points, but defeating a single imp boosted their level by a remarkable 12 points. While Granfell brushes off such details, Lee ponders how to allocate the stat points efficiently. Feeling tired, Lee considers going to bed, but Granfell insists on cleaning up the messy apartment. Later that evening, Granfell takes his time cooking a healthy meal. Lee, already feeling hungry, realizes that Granfell follows regular schedules and practices self-restraint, unlike himself. Despite feeling famished, Lee acknowledges the positive impact Granfell's habits have on his own lifestyle. He reflects on Granfell's talents, noting his proficiency in magic, intelligence, and physical fitness. He receives a lengthy message from Cheolman, but chooses to ignore it for the time being. Instead, he focuses on testing Granfell's ability to imitate spells by watching videos. Cheolman and Taman are astonished by Granfell's simple response of no to their guild invitation offer. Cheolman wonders if Granfell received an even better offer from another guild. But Taman is skeptical, considering the generous offer they had extended to him. Cheolman speculates that it could be a guild from abroad or one of the top guilds in Seoul. Taman is determined not to let Granfell slip away and decides to bring him into their guild before any other guild can make a move. When Taman asks Cheolman to describe Granfell's appearance so he can find him, Cheolman struggles to describe Granfell, eventually likening him to a sophisticated aristocrat from a fantasy novel. Granfell, after learning that he can imitate any magical ability after observing it, meticulously records all the magical techniques he observed on his phone and realizes that he can grasp the basics of magic now. He feels confident that he can utilize these techniques if he has enough mana. Lee admires Granfell's intelligence, even though he finds him cringy at times. Granfell finds Lee's reaction rude, but Lee believes he can now allocate his stat points efficiently with this newfound knowledge. Although uncertain about Granfell's complete set of talents, Lee remains open to all possibilities. 
He allocates two points each to stamina and agility, and seven points to mana due to its low level. With one point remaining, Lee reflects on Granfell's tragic past, questioning why he included such darkness. He decides to invest the final point in luck, hoping for better fortunes for both himself and Granfell in the future. Though he only increases his luck by one point, Lee feels like he's doubled his luck, anticipating finding money in the streets. The next morning, Lee is astonished to find more than just money. He's been assigned a whole class quest. Such quests had become rare after the events of the game appeared in the real world, mainly because there weren't many NPCs in the real world to give quests. Even ordinary quests had become scarce. Lee comes across an article about a paladin who also received a class quest, a significant event that garners top news coverage. Lee realizes that receiving a class quest is a tremendous achievement, usually granted to only one person in each class. Although logically, as a level 67, he shouldn't qualify for such a quest. Lee believes he may be the last remaining demon hunter in the world after all. Recalling his past experiences in demon hunter training, Lee reflects on the challenging quests and inadequate facilities. Despite the hardships, Granfell found the training beneficial as it strengthened him mentally. Lee decides to focus on the present and investigates the class quest he received. He learns that the AAOU, Anti-Arcana United Korean Branch, is a facility aimed at mitigating chaos and damages worldwide. The organization hired former Arcana employees to assist in their efforts. In response to the updates in Arcana, which are supposed to reflect in the real world, they gather information and analyze it for the players. Essentially, they are now overworked employees. One employee curses Arcana for still existing while stretching and asks another worker who has been there longer. The experienced worker says that they should hope that a new update doesn't arrive. While the new worker remarks that Raymond, the CEO of Arcana, is extremely creepy. He must be the one managing the homepage and always uploading the updates. The experienced worker tells him to stop chatting and keep refreshing the homepage to look for the update. The new worker questions how it is possible for the updated content to appear in the real world right after the update appears on the game website. Suddenly, an update appears, and they both start sweating profusely. The whole office goes into a frenzy, with one person even starting to write their resignation letter, and another unplugging all the phones fearing the press would call them. The update centers around demons, with a new rupture appearing containing the Count family's fortress territory and the territory outskirts. There are new monsters, all with high levels, the lowest being 220. Additionally, there is a new named monster, Count Oscura, who is level 430. The new worker thinks this is insane, considering the current top player is only level 403. This update seems plainly unfair and impossible to clear, even if top players join forces. The experienced worker explains that the issue isn't just difficulty, but even a whole association wouldn't be able to handle it. The new worker suggests seeking help from NPCs at the Mage Tower, but the experienced worker dismisses the idea, explaining they won't intervene unless the tower itself is at risk. The situation seems impossible, with no viable solutions in sight. The new worker warns against jumping to conclusions, as failing the rupture raid could lead to real-world casualties. The experienced worker believes the updates so far have been manageable, but this one completely disrupts the balance, presenting an unthinkable challenge. Unless a miracle occurs, they're in trouble. Meanwhile, Granfell looks at his quest, which begins with hunting a demon condition, which he has already completed after defeating the imp demon. Now, he receives a repeated quest to intensely train his weak body. Lee dreads the physical exertion, feeling as if he's never left Akshan in the first place. His body trembles with exhaustion, wondering if it's okay to push himself so hard. However, Granfell feels a sense of achievement driven by his pride in accomplishing anything he sets his mind to. With the difficult quest completed, Lee looks forward to some well-deserved rest and eagerly anticipates the next quest. In the early morning at a park, Granfell is doing pull-ups while Lee is fuming with anger. He received another quest, similar to the last one. Run 20 kilometers, do 1,000 push-ups, 500 pull-ups, and 300 burpee tests, all of which he completed yesterday. Lee wonders why they keep getting the same type of quest every day for the past week. Each time he finishes one, another pops up the next day. Granfell sits on a bench, completely drained, and Lee thinks he can manage all of this because of Granfell's traits, but he wonders how many more quests they need to do to get a reward. 
Suddenly, the system notes that Granfell has completed a week of daily quests and rewards him with two points each in stamina and dexterity. Lee is thrilled with these rewards, especially since they're permanent. Items that increase stats are usually incredibly expensive, requiring millions of currency just to raise one point. But here, he just boosted four points without even leveling up, which seems incredibly advantageous. Granfell remarks that he'd do these quests ten times a day for rewards like this while struggling to catch his breath, but Lee advises him to calm down. Granfell overhears some news from the park's radio. Most guilds have decided to give up on the new Rupture update raid. A reporter announces details about the update and the formidable new monster, Count Uskara, a half-demon, half-vampire hybrid with a level of 430, the highest ever seen. It's believed to be the most challenging raid yet. Granfell watches the news on his phone while brushing his teeth, and Lee wonders how anyone could defeat such a powerful monster. We learn that panic spreads as guilds withdraw upon hearing about Count Oscura. Lee reflects that demons pose the greatest challenge for players, because they grow stronger with each battle, and players are faced with their abnormal abilities. It is often advised that one must be ten levels higher to defeat a demon so Count Osra's towering level makes him seemingly unbeatable. As the only vampire alive currently, the quest seems to imply it's up to Lee to fight Count Oscura. He's scared but determined to face this impossible enemy, though he feels calm inside. This body no longer belongs to him. Meanwhile, Granfell is ready to punish the vampire, seeing him as an inferior species interfering with his plans. Lee decides his first stop should be the Mage Tower where a portal allows instant teleportation anywhere. This is why many guilds worldwide have branches in Korea. He plans to take a bus instead of the train due to multiple transfers. Granfell says it's time to go as every moment counts in this situation. Lee insists that Granfell can't just leave without taking proper rest, and Granfell stops, realizing he forgot something. Lee breathes a sigh of relief, but his relief is short-lived as Granfell grabs a few packs of instant tea declaring tea time as the most important part of the day. Meanwhile, news outlets gather around the Mage Tower, preparing to interview the Gaon Guild, who are expected to arrive soon. A rookie reporter marvels at the number of reporters present and asks a cameraman if Gaon Guild is really coming. The cameraman confirms, explaining that since the new rupture is in Russia and the Mage Tower is nearby, it's likely they'll show up. Suddenly, the Gaon Guild arrives with Taman leading the way. Reporters swarm in with a barrage of questions about their plans to raid the rupture and whether they'll share information with other guilds. The rookie reporter eagerly asks Taman about their strategy against Count Oscura. Chilman tries to delay interviews for later, but Taman laughs, admitting they have no plan to defeat Count Oscura. They didn't consider killing him when entering the rupture and won't share information with other guilds, even if they claim it's for world peace. Taman suggests those who truly seek peace should challenge the Rupturists themselves instead of relying on the information. Just then, the Shining Guild arrives, led by Lox, their leader. Lox explains to his guild they'll have to walk to the Mage's Tower due to the crowd, and one member comments on the harsh words of Gan's guild. Taman expresses anxiety as large guilds flock to Korea because of the Mage Tower, feeling their position is declining. Chailman reassures him, suggesting they proceed slowly the best approach. Taman asks if Chailman tried contacting Lee aka Granfell again, but Chailman explains they've been too busy since the update. Taman speculates Lee might attempt the rupture raid, and they might encounter him at the Mage Tower. Meanwhile, on a bus, Granfell watches yet another magic tutorial video, marking it as his 100th. He reflects on the three levels of magic, and tries out a skill he learned from the video, alarming the driver. Lee prompts Granfell to apologize, which he does somewhat arrogantly. Granfell then checks his skill tab but doesn't find the skill he just used, questioning if it is a bug. Eventually, they arrive at the Mage Tower, which appears different from the inside. Granfell approaches the portal and feels a vaguous sensation as if he could also use teleportation magic. Before he can contemplate further, he's accidentally pushed into the portal by a man carrying something. Taiman scolds the man for being careless, and Chilman notices the man resembles Granfell but is interrupted by Taiman, who asks for a briefing on the new rupture in Russia. Chilman explains the rupture's layout and the potential summoning of Count Oscura, castle in the real world if the rupture breaks. 
In Russia, numerous news outlets cover the new ruptures, with even a vlogger live-streaming the event. Suddenly, Granfell arrives, and the vlogger mistakes him for a reporter, and tells him to find another rupture since he was there first. Granfell, lacking patience, orders the vlogger to move. He approaches a rupture at the territory outskirts, hoping it's warmer inside. On the other side, he encounters a berserker class named Leonie, and her group fighting the demon monsters. Leoni, the berserker guildmaster, has a tendency to use colorful language. Granfell notices growling behind him and faces several bloodied wolves, all level 230. Despite being level 67, he's confident in his natural enemy skill. Meanwhile, in another part of the outskirts, Leone's group assesses dead wolves. Leone kicks one, expressing frustration. Her guild members try to calm her down, but she remains agitated. They discuss the wolves' odd behavior. They show no fear or pain. Suddenly, they hear a desperate howl in the distance, unlike the wolves' usual cries. Curious, Leone urges the party to investigate, despite their hesitation. Back to Granfell, he uses a bow, sensing the gathered mana at the arrowhead. Despite the arrow's poor craftsmanship, he manipulates the mana to engulf it in flames, killing a demon wolf instantly. The others hesitate to attack, unable to outrun Granfell's agility. Later, Leone arrives and finds Granfell among the wolf carcasses, calmly drinking tea. She wonders if he has a fire arrow magic skill and questions why he's dressed in a suit and drinking tea amidst the chaos. A guild member speculates he might be a streamer who got left behind by a guild. Leone warns Granfell of the danger and urges him to leave, but Granfell ignores her, continuing to drink his tea. Leone is furious that Granfell ignored her, but her guild members struggle to stifle their laughter. As she tries to scold him, the guild members warn of new enemies surrounding them. The party braces for defense, but they're terrified by the sudden onslaught and wonder where the enemies came from. The Blood Bandits, matching the wolves' level at 230, close in on them. A guild member advises caution as the bandits brandish weapons. Leone prepares to activate her skills and swiftly slashes numerous bandits in a single moment. She reassures her party, but their confidence is shattered when they spot demon archers ready to rain arrows on them from a nearby hill. With no escape route, panic occurs at the party. Meanwhile, Granfell finishes his tea, surprising Leone who expected him to flee. She questions his sanity and urges him to leave immediately. But Granfell remains calm, examining his thermos. As the bandits unleash a volley of arrows, Granfell inspects the mana within the thermos and interferes with it, preparing to manifest a powerful spell. He faces a risky maneuver, knowing that attempting to manifest without adequate mana could cause him to pass out. However, he realizes that the magic spells he uses might not be skilled, leading to a surge of newfound understanding about mana's potential. With a surge of blue mana, he creates a massive wall of rocks, shielding the party from the incoming arrows. Leone recognizes the wall's creation as alchemy, a skill she's never witnessed before. Granfell clarifies that it's not a skill, but pure, unrestrained magic. Though surprised, the party is grateful for the rescue. They ponder Granfell's identity, questioning why an alchemist would be present in such a dangerous situation. As the bandits break through the wall, Granfell laments delaying his tea time once again. The guild readies for battle, with Leone instructing Granfell to stay back. However, Granfell has different plans, summoning his bow and arrow ready to join the fight. One of the guild members urgently calls for a healer as a comrade suffers a severe injury. However, this distracts him, allowing a bandit to attack from behind with no chance to evade. Suddenly, Anaro swiftly dispatches the bandit, prompting the guild member to question if their guild ever had such a skilled archer. Leone is taken aback by this revelation and wonders about the purpose of the protective wall if Granfell is an archer. To her surprise, Granfell sets the arrow ablaze, raising more questions about his abilities. This kind of attack could easily title him to be a mage. His diverse skill set leaves Leone puzzled about his true identity. After dealing with the bandits, scouts report that the area is clear of enemies. Leone praises their efforts but harbors frustration towards Granfell. She finds his presence in such a perilous situation while dressed casually absurd. Despite her irritation, she acknowledges his crucial role in saving them from certain death. She grapples with conflicting feelings, noticing his handsome appearance but remaining hesitant to express gratitude due to his earlier dismissal. However, 
Granfell's gaze catches her off guard while he prepares his tea, stirring unexpected emotions within her. Leone's mind races with thoughts of his intentions, wondering if he desires to share tea with her. Her hopes are dashed when Granfell bluntly informs her that he has no tea for her, leaving her disheartened. Meanwhile, outside the rupture, drones surveil the area as reporters from Arcana broadcast updates on the situation. They highlight the global attention garnered by the update, particularly due to the appearance of the highest level boss encountered thus far. The rupture, named the Territory Outskirts, is the first of three new ruptures introduced in the update. While numerous ruptures lead to the same location, access to advanced areas will be granted later. Major guilds like Shining and Gaon are already inside the rupture, racing to be the first to clear it and gain fame. In a nearby tent, a man, presumably the director of a news agency, monitors the news updates. His assistant enters, suggesting that he might want coffee, given his position. Concerned about the darkness inside the tent, the assistant questions the director's preferences. The director explains his fondness for dim lighting and inquires about the status of the rupture and any new video footage. Learning that Shining Guild is currently leading the progress, the director decides to position themselves near Shining in anticipation of interviewing them first upon their exit. The assistant predicts that it will take a considerable amount of time to clear the rupture, so they decide to monitor the drones instead. Suddenly, he notices something alarming and rushes outside, despite obstructing the camera's view. The reporter apologizes for the assistant's impulsive behavior, and the director urgently instructs everyone to follow. The assistant as a rupture has turned blue, indicating that someone has successfully cleared it. Curious about the identity of the guild that achieved this feat, the reporter questions the director, who lacks the necessary information. They sprint towards the blue rupture, where the assistant is taken aback by what he sees. Upon making contact with the director, he excitedly reveals that the Berserker Guild has cleared the first rupture, much to the director's surprise given their low rank. The assistant promptly sends a video to the director, who observes that Shining Guild is still progressing in the middle of this new rupture setting. Furthermore, the assistant notices a Korean individual among the Berserker Guild members, which adds to the confusion as Berserker is a European guild. As other reporters rush in, the assistant endeavors to secure a prime position. Meanwhile, the director remains perplexed, and the assistant approaches Granfell for an interview, bombarding him with inquiries about his affiliation with the Berserker Guild and their experience inside the rupture. Granfell curtly demands that the assistant move aside, testing his patience to the limit before departing due to the cold. Following the clear, the Berserker Guild is inundated with interview requests, but Leone refuses to comment and expresses frustration towards Granfell for clearing the rupture first. She vents her anger, questioning his sudden departure despite his solo achievement. Her outburst attracts attention, leaving reporters stunned. Subsequently, another rupture is cleared, drawing interviewers to the scene. Gaon Guild emerges as the second clearers, appearing exhausted and bloodied. Taemin notices the presence of the Berserker Guild and questions if they were truly the first to clear it. Leone's ambiguous comment about who's Korea's top guild piques curiosity leading to speculation among the interviewers. At Gaon Guild's base camp, Chailman and Taemin watch the news while enjoying hot noodles. Taemin becomes infuriated by Leonie's seemingly smug remark, interpreting it as a slight against Gaon's accomplishment. Chailman wonders about Leonie's intentions behind the statement, while Taemin adamantly defends their guild's superiority in Korea. He becomes so angry that he hands the ramen to one of their assistants, who happily accepts it. However, the container is empty because Taemin has already finished eating it. Cheolman suggests that Leone probably meant she encountered a stronger Korean player in the rupture, while Taemin speculates it might be someone from the Mythology Guild. They question who the other Korean player could be. Cheolman suggests there might be only one person who fits the description. After taking a hot shower, Granfell feels embarrassed by Lee's joyful dancing, and Lee mentions he's eager to take a long nap after the shower. However, their plans are disrupted when Granfell detects dust and gets to cleaning. Lee is upset because he was looking forward to resting. After cleaning and scavenging for a meal, Lee watches Granfell enjoy tea, but finds himself no longer sleepy. He inspects the gear they obtained from the rupture and checks his stats, finding his level increased by 19, making it to 86. Despite the high difficulty and danger of the rupture, he feels the loot wasn't very useful. 
Granfell remarks on the slow mana regeneration, attributing it to their lack of accessories and the limitations of the demon hunter class. He wishes he knew who the group that helped them was so he could thank them properly. Grenfell surprises Lee by admitting his previous trait of always proving himself when underestimated, or living up to expectations when overestimated. Grenfell explains that the next rupture will be in the Count family's territory, emphasizing the need to improve combat skills alongside magic. Lee agrees, recalling the combat skills displayed by their allies during the last rupture. Grenfell decides to start another body training quest despite Lee's protests, believing that mastering the basics is crucial. However, he insists on doing the dishes first, emphasizing the importance of cleanliness. Lee wonders how he'll fit sleep into their busy schedule. Later that night, Granfell starts running while listening to the radio, prompting Lee to cry out of exhaustion. Suddenly, the radio station announces urgent news, grabbing their attention. The news states that currently, most of the territory outskirts ruptures have been cleared, and soon, the Count's territory will be open for raiding. However, alarming news arrives. The destruction progress rate of the Count's territory suddenly jumps to a large 60%, even though it's not yet accessible. This raises concerns among experts, because if the destruction continues at this pace, the Count's territory might collapse, releasing demon monsters in the real world. The Gongild observes this development, and Taman finds it impossible. They question how it is possible when it's only been a day, yet the destruction progress is already at 60%. Chielman explains that the time limit to clear the territory decreases as the monsters inside become stronger. Taman wonders why it's sped up suddenly. Chielman acknowledges that he needs to investigate further because it's quite unusual. At the Arcana News Camp, the director is frantic as there must be a reason for the sudden increase in monster strength. The assistant points out that even the analysts from advanced guilds are clueless. The director insists that they must take action. Otherwise, it spells disaster for everyone. If a rupture collapses like this, monsters will swarm out, endangering civilians and players alike. Granfell delves deeper into the issue and discovers that such a phenomenon has never occurred before. This information was only available through auction, which is now destroyed. He realizes that vampires like Count Oscura share authority through their blood. When his demons die, their authority returns to the owner, who can then redistribute it among other demon monsters thus making them stronger and accelerating the destruction rate. However, raiding the Count's territory poses a risk because if they defeat him, the fortress might collapse instantly afterward. Lee is impressed but raises concerns about sleep. Granfell insists he'll only rest once the Count is defeated. As the Count's territory starts to fracture, there are only five hours left until it collapses completely. More people gather around the rupture, including a streamer named Huigang broadcasting live from the snowy mountains of Russia. With the destruction progressing at 70%, there are less than five hours remaining. Despite the early hour, numerous guilds are present. Wigang explains that this time, the Count's territory has only 30 entrances, much fewer than the previous rupture. Since there are fewer entrances, multiple guilds have decided to enter one rupture together. However, the distribution of experience points and loot depends on each guild's contribution, so they must collaborate to benefit equally. Despite the information, the chat continues to criticize Huigang. Taman mentions they're fine as long as they're not up against the Shining Guild. Chilman reassures him that the Shining Guild is targeting the Unified Under Heaven Guild, not Gaon. Taman is surprised since Unified Under Heaven holds the second rank. Chilman explains that Berserker is allied with Second Son and Bohemian so they're playing it safe. However, Huigang's stream starts losing viewers, and despite his pleas, they leave. Suddenly, Hisagi Kazuma, the master of the fourth-ranking guild Inazuma, appears. Taiman's expression turns wicked as he confronts Kazuma, who belittles Gaon Guild. Huigang is surprised by Inazuma's arrival, and his viewers are intrigued. Kazuma dismisses Taiman and asserts Inazuma's superiority. Both guilds prepare for a clash. Huigang sees a lucrative opportunity to record the confrontation, and other streamers and reporters rush to cover it. Meanwhile, Chilman advises Huigang to focus on the bigger issue, the destruction progress of the rupture, stressing that competition will only lead to a loss for all involved. As tension rises, streamers start favoring Inazuma over Gaon, citing, they are one rank higher. 
the rivalry between Kazuma and Taemin adds fuel to the fire. These remarks sting Cheolmen, and both guilds are ready to battle. Cheolmen insists they must hold their ground, since they were there first. With a nod from Cheolmen, Taemin eagerly prepares to confront Inazuma. Thus, Gaon and Inazuma enter the Easter Rupture simultaneously, sparking media attention due to their rivalry and differing nationalities. Meanwhile, in the northernmost rupture, shining and unified under heaven guilds are positioned, while Berserker, Second Son, and Bohemia guilds gather in the southern rupture. The destruction progress reaches a critical 80%, causing widespread fear. Inside the Count's territory, Granfell enjoys tea, contemplating the mana shortage he faced in the last rupture. He devises a magic derived from his alchemy skill to shape objects as needed. However, intricate creations require more mana making it inefficient for combat. Granfell also realizes another issue. Suddenly, soldiers of the Count, all level 300, appear. Granfell extends his hand and expresses disappointment at the meager authority granted by the Count. He effortlessly transforms nearby rock formations into teacups using his Restore to Original State skill, which he dubs Reversal Magic. Lee finds the name cringy but lets it pass. In another area of the territory, Taemin swiftly dispatches soldiers waiting to ambush monsters. He realizes they've encountered fewer monsters than expected, a sentiment echoed by Inazuma guild members they encounter. Despite entering the same rupture, their paths diverge, leaving them puzzled. Suddenly, Inazuma appears, and Kazuma finds the tranquility boring. Taemin questions Kazuma's sudden friendliness, leading to a tense confrontation until Chaelman interrupts, warning them to leave the area due to an impending swarm. Before they can react, the ground shakes, heralding the arrival of the Count's Knights, all level 350. Taemin and Kazuma reluctantly prepare to fight, realizing the cavalry's devastating power. They strategize to defend against the onslaught, but Chilman advises against direct confrontation, citing the Unified Under Heaven Guild's heavy losses in a similar scenario. As they contemplate their options, the ground fractures, pillars emerging to neutralize most of the cavalry's movements. Grand Fell reveals himself, stunning Chaelman and saving Taemin's group. Chaelman identifies Grand Fell as their savior, and the person they sought to recruit. Meanwhile, Huigen continues streaming, trailing Gaon Guild despite the danger. When an explosion rocks the area, Huigen's viewers urge him to investigate. As he hurries, Kazuma marvels at Grand Fell's abilities and questions his identity. As knights are trapped between the pillars, Taemin sees an opportunity. The stone pillars slow down the enemy horses, creating a perfect opening for Taemin to strike. He activates his berserk skill, boosting his attack power and reducing damage taken. Leaping into the air, he cuts through one of the horsemen knights, causing damage to the others. Kazuma seizes the opportunity and orders his guild to charge forward as well. Meanwhile, Huigang's viewership surges as they witness Grandfell's incredible magic. Using reversal magic, Granfell crushes two horsemen, leaving Huigeng and his viewers in awe. Granfell summons a dagger and manipulates its mana to maintain its durability, effectively leveling up as he strikes the enemy. Seeing Granfell's skill, Lee is relieved that they won't need to pay for weapon repairs, boosting their savings. The Gon Guild celebrates their success, but Taemin remains fixated on Granfell, who calmly enjoys his tea. Chaelman reaffirms their desire to recruit Granfell, and Taemin is determined not to let other guilds snatch him up, especially since Inazuma witnessed his abilities too. Summoning his courage, Huigang approaches Granfell for an interview, attracting a massive audience. Inazuma members also approach Granfell, eager to recruit him. Taemin intervenes, offering Granfell a handshake and introducing himself, hoping Granfell remembers his recent text about joining their guild. However, Granfell declines stating he has more pressing matters. The chat explodes with reactions, some finding his response cool or amusing. News about Granfell spreads across the internet, catching the interest of the Shining Guild. Leader Locks consults Camilla and Dimitri, who have mixed reactions. Camilla suggests scouting Granfell, intrigued by his cool demeanor, while Dimitri accuses Locks of jealousy, feeling overshadowed by Granfell's popularity. Camille suggests that the hypey surrounding Granfell may just be a typical exaggeration, and Dimitri agrees, saying he can't be late for his date with someone. They leave Locks to contemplate alone. Jesse Hines, a level 397 player, approaches Locks, describing Granfell's actions as magical, yet not quite. 
Lox is surprised by Jessie's unusual praise and listens as she further analyzes the situation, eventually suggesting that the info on Granfell requires further study. Meanwhile, at the Berserker Guild camp, Leone vents her frustration for missing the chance to recruit Granfell at her guild members. At the Inazuma Guild camp, Kazuma receives a call urging them to recruit the silver-haired man emphasizing the importance of bringing him to their side. In the latest news report, it's announced that the Count family territory has been successfully cleared by the Shining Guild, narrowly beating out Unified Under Heaven for first place. However, tension remains high as the Count's family fortress ruptures destruction rate stands at 72%, posing a significant risk to Russia. Prayers and well wishes are extended to those involved. Granfell watches news coverage about himself, being dubbed a mysterious player. Various news outlets discuss his actions extensively, while reaction channels exaggerate the situation. Experts weigh in, expressing disbelief at Granfell's ability to manipulate the terrain in such a manner to save lives. Reflecting on the events, Granfell considers that he may have simply run out of mana at the time. Lee is relieved the media is not labeling him negatively. Granfell also discovers a rare item among their loot, a necklace imbued with a blood curse. This devil item requires purification to unleash its true power. Most players discard such items due to the effort required to remove the curse, but there's another option. Using the exorcism ritual skill to invite a demon into one's consciousness. This exclusive demon hunter skill allows for attacking demons without harming their host. However, there's a risk of possession if the user's mental state is weak. As he further contemplates their findings, Cheolman calls, possibly regarding Granfell's actions on live television. Lee wonders about the potential repercussions of Granfell's actions on Gaon's guild master. He decides not to take the call and opts to send a message instead to clear things up. However, Granfell, unaware of the situation, responds with a single word. Troublesome. This omission makes Cheolman and Taemin think he's ignoring them again. Taemin sighs, regretting his informality toward Lee, and acknowledges they should have offered him a deal. Watching the news playback, they realize the situation was indeed informal, with everyone bombarding Grandfell with questions. They notice his angered eyes, however unbeknownst to them, the eyes were such because of the exhaustion of using mana. Taemin concludes they must focus on the Count's situation as the rupture's destruction rate climbs to 83%, prompting them to cut their rest short and act. Suddenly, the ground shakes and urgent news broadcasts blare from every speaker. The Count's family. Fortress rupture has collapsed instantly, with a 100% destruction rate. Chaos ensues in the base camps, with around 200 injured. International advisories urge Russia to close its borders, prompting a swift evacuation of players. As the fortress emerges into the real world, Granfell remains unfazed by its collapse and enters alone. Stopping at a statue, he finds distasteful. Wondering how the vampire could call this place a fortress, Granfell's comment about its size compared to his family mansion amuses Lee. Suddenly, the statue's glowing eyes startle Lee as it comes to life, ready to attack Granfell. Other players debate whether to intervene or flee, but Granfell effortlessly shatters the statue with a flick of his fingers, leaving everyone in awe. The commotion catches the attention of the Shining Guild, and Camilla recognizes the noise from the video about the white-haired man. Curious, Jesse flies toward the source, ignoring Lox's advice to wait. Witnessing Granfell's victory, the players gain newfound confidence and charge in. As they explore, Granfell receives a class quest to instill fear in the vampire aristocrat. Lee questions the quest's meaning, but Granfell is determined to proceed. They reach a banquet hall where the Count's portraits emanate an unsettling feeling. While elsewhere, the Gone Guild struggles against a mysterious influence. Cheolman checks on Taemin, who admits feeling suffocated in the hallway filled with portraits of the Count, sensing a constant watchfulness akin to demon-induced status abnormalities. Cheolman deduces the portraits linked to the Count and suggests burning them, which they promptly do. The relief is evident, with Cheolman explaining how everything in the castle from portraits to statues, triggers abnormalities, clarifying why earlier players retreated swiftly. Taemin attributes Shining Guild's cautiousness to advance, but worries about escalating challenges given his barbarian class's susceptibility to abnormalities. Granfell critiques the portraits as trash, questioning how anyone could dine amidst such clutter. Lee finds his criticism harsh, 
but Granfell persists, disparaging the statue's quality and pondering the excess of portraits as a sign of narcissism. He ridicules the fortress's layout, noting unnecessary forks and hallways leading to dead ends, mocking its design and intelligence. As Granfell ridicules the castle, he reaches a stairway leading to a large door, likely the Count's room. Jesse interrupts, praising Granfell's magic and questioning it, but he rebuffs her, emphasizing manners in requesting instruction. Before they ascend the stairs, the Count emerges, triggering Granfell's natural enemy skill, focusing solely on him. He denounces the Count as a vulgar vampire, presenting the cursed necklace as an offering to invoke the exorcism ritual skill. Lee realizes they can battle the Count in Granfell's consciousness, understanding his role as a vampire hunter. However, Jesse warns of the Count absorbing power from subordinates, exacerbating the level gap. The necklace shatters, transporting them into Granfell's mind. Count, surprised, attempts to attack Granfell with flames, but finds him vanished. Granfell taunts him, eventually appearing above a dead version of the Count, shocking him. Meanwhile, the Count unleashes havoc in the real world. Lee, seemingly afraid, remains calm under the night sky, while Jesse admires Granfell's apparent prediction of the Count's attack. Granfell employs the exorcism ritual skill, targeting the Count. This skill allows the user to attack only the possessed demon, with the outcome determined by mental fortitude. The vampire Count, in a frenzy, attacks with bats, but Granfell remains unfazed. Jesse observes in awe as Granfell terrifies the vampire, resembling the fear demons instill in humans. Granfell completes the quest by instilling fear in the Count. Jesse questions him about his magic, but Granfell ignores her, opting to finish the Count. However, his attack proves futile, prompting him to urge Jesse to finish the Count. Jesse realizes Granfell's intent, to teach her to become stronger. She casts a spell, obliterating the vampire. The system congratulates Granfell on completing the quest and grants him another class quest, Brewing, proclaiming him the beacon of light in a world overrun by demons. The Shining Guild arrives, curious about Jesse's feet, and Jesse introduces herself to Granfell in a careful formal manner. Granfell and Lee recognize Jesse's willingness to learn to be formal, despite her poor manners and reward her with his name, Lee Hoyol. In an apartment, a woman cooking dinner with her daughter hears news of Lee's expedition and recognizes him on TV, referring to him as her younger brother. She's confused at first, but when she looks at the TV, she sees Lee introducing himself to the world. Later, while cleaning, she gets calls from her sisters. Ever since Count Ascura's defeat, Lee's face has been everywhere in the media, so it's no surprise his family finds it out. He receives calls from all three of his older sisters, who were close growing up, except for him, the only boy who was often bullied by his sisters. He's hesitant to pick up, expecting their usual yelling. Suddenly, there are three knocks at the door, and his sisters demand he open up. Lee is scared as they wait. The first sister, Yoon-hee, is on the left. The second, Ji-yoon, is in the middle, and the third, Yurim, is on the right. Granfell opens the door, telling them to quiet down to avoid bothering the neighbors. He invites them in, surprising them with his charming demeanor. Meanwhile, Yurim notices another news report about Lee defeating Askura with Jesse from the Shining Guild. Despite interviewers attempts to extract more information, Lee simply identified himself and left. Chiolman and Taiman watch, reflecting on Lee's newfound fame and the possibility of him joining their guild. Taiman is confident Lee will consider them first, given their prior cooperation and the loot from their recent battle. Chiolman questions how much they're willing to offer Lee. And Taman says, all the recent loot emphasizes the importance of leaving a lasting impression, even if they lose him to another guild. Meanwhile, Granfell is busy at home, with his niece doing his hair as his sisters chat. Yun Hai compliments his new hair color, while Ji Yoon jokes that he looks like a K-pop star. Yurim, however, finds his brother's demeanor odd. As they banter, Granfell offers tea while his sisters reminisce about their childhood. They tease him about his middle school days, when he was used to mimicking Granfell's attitude. Yerim asks if he's in danger, concerned about his well-being, since he rarely answers his phone. Lee appreciates their concern, realizing their teasing comes from love. They assure him of their support and advise him to quit if he wishes. Lee tries to reassure them but cringes at his past antics. As they finish their tea, Granfell bids them farewell, looking forward to their next meeting. 
Yerim reminds him to save money, prompting Lee to check his account for the rupture clear reward, the main source of player funding. He eagerly anticipates the amount, hoping for a substantial sum. At the Shining Guild, Camila keeps bothering Jesse for information about Lee, who she finds interesting. Jesse repeatedly tells her she doesn't know much about him. But Camilla persists. This irritates Jesse, who emits a dangerous aura and asks to be left alone. Camilla gives up, wondering why Jesse is watching videos on Korean etiquette. Meanwhile, a notification informs Jesse that the reward for clearing the rupture has been sent. Lee also receives this notification and is shocked to see that he has been credited with 110 billion, a huge amount of money. However, Granfell finds Lee's excitement over pocket money annoying. Among the loot Lee obtained from defeating Ascura is the Vampire Orb, a unique rank-cursed item similar to the necklace. In the past, Lee would have dismissed this item as trash, but now he sees its potential use in the exorcism ritual. However, he's unsure what to do with the orb, the necklace, and the large sum of money. He finds himself unable to sleep, constantly worrying about how to handle these newfound assets. Granfell advises him to stop overthinking and get some rest, but Lee continues to fret about what to do next. The next day, at the Korean department, employees discuss Lee's feats and speculate about alchemy being involved. Some are skeptical, arguing that alchemy couldn't create such massive rock columns. The discussion devolves into bickering, exhausting the experienced employee who observes the chaos. He predicts that the hype around Lee will eventually die down with time. However, when news of a new update arrives, introducing the Yusra Archipelago, excitement reignites. This mysterious region, known as the Island of Treasure, was rumored to contain priceless treasures. The addition of this new region brings hope to the players. Meanwhile, the Academic Society of Mages announces its revival, promising to enhance mage skills. Lee and Granfell watch this news, intrigued. They also note Jesse's involvement in the Academic Society of Mages, despite Lee's earlier reprimand about manners. Despite Lee's annoyance, Granfell expresses more interest in the Academic Society of Mages. In the world of mages, there's a well-known saying about the Tower of the Mages having magic, but lacking skills. Lee recalls this quote from the description of the mage's tower in the old Arcana video game. Granfell admits he's not sure what this society is about, but figures he might gain something from attending. He plans to go after finishing the dishes, much to Lee's confusion. At the mage's tower, a crowd gathers outside, eagerly awaiting the doors to open. Cleo, associated with the mage's tower, eagerly anticipates the academic society's revival and wonders what she'll learn. A mishap nearly occurs when a guy walks backward and almost crashes into Cleo, who miraculously remains untouched due to an illusionary wall. Jesse corrects Cleo's statement, explaining the wall's purpose. Cleo, embarrassed, guides everyone to the Crystal Hall, where the meeting will take place. Later, Grandfell arrives at the tower, finding it overcrowded as usual. He speculates that many are trying to reach Ayusra or join the Mages Society. Suddenly, Lee is recognized, and admirers swarm him, requesting various things. Both Lee and Granfell are annoyed and seek to escape, but one person grabs Lee's bag, asking for a picture. Granfell, protective of his tea, snaps at the person, shocking Lee. However, instead of backing off, the admirer becomes even more fervent, attracting more people to request pictures with Lee. Disappointed by the situation, Lee and Granfell brainstorm ways to escape the crowd. They notice a peculiar wall, and Granfell charges towards it, almost colliding with Cleo, who guides him upstairs. Cleo, puzzled by Granfell's ability to see through the illusion wall, wonders who he is. Lee thinks she might be sick due to her intense staring. Cleo explains that those who see through the illusion are allowed to attend the meeting even without an invitation, but Granfell's ability surprises her. She's curious about him academically. They reach the Crystal Hall, where NPCs from the game now exist in real life. Marcello, the head mage, is highly esteemed for his wisdom and influence. Jesse's talking hat praises Marcello, but Jesse pays it no mind, much to the hat's dismay. Jesse finds herself growing sleepy and bored during the meeting. As someone who views magic as a skill in itself, she doesn't see the relevance of the discussions on the quantization of magic. She would have skipped the meeting altogether, if not for her class quest, so she reluctantly endures it. Marcello notices her disinterest and asks if she's bored. He explains that the tower was summoned to this world for exploration and other purposes, although indirectly as part of a new abdaten. 
He acknowledges that their form of magic might be unfamiliar to them, much like how they struggle to understand science. However, he emphasizes the need for cooperation to restore peace in their world. This leads him to introduce the concept of fusion, where magic and science are combined to create ignition. As Marcello demonstrates fusion by creating a small ball of flame, Jesse becomes intrigued. Marcello enlists their help in exploring this new development. This prompts Granfell to question the unnecessity of certain elements in Marcello's demonstration. Marcello's uncharacteristic calmness surprises the council, signaling potential trouble ahead. Granfell argues that the combination of science and magic introduces unnecessary elements due to their inherent differences. He draws parallels to his own experiences, combining skills and magic. To everyone's shock, Lee demonstrates the same fusion technique with ease, explaining his use of centrifugal force to enhance its effectiveness. Marcello, initially taken aback, invites Lee to join him in his research to accelerate the progress of an understanding of magic. Granfell eagerly accepts, though his demeanor makes it seem like he's triumphed over Marcello. Meanwhile, Leone and her guild arrive at the Yusra Archipelago, finding it overly crowded. They observe various NPCs including the Lionheart Knights and the Explorer Alliance, showing interest in Treasure Island. Leone receives a call from a guild member who attended the meeting, informing her of Lee's involvement and a quest offered to him by Marcello. This news amuses Leone, who sees Lee as somewhat eccentric. Marcello faces scrutiny from the Tower's Five Stars for inviting a player to collaborate, which violates their rules. Marcello defends his decision, citing Lee's deep understanding of magic and his bridging of the gap between magic and science. He believes Lee's talents can greatly benefit the world, despite the objections of the Five Stars, who emphasize the importance of mages acting independently. The Council respects Marcello's decision for the time being but reminds him that he'll have to take responsibility eventually. Marcello feels frustrated, thinking about how the older members of the Council reject help from outside sources due to pride, which he believes will harm them in the long run. Cleo approaches Marcello, mentioning that she's on her way to pick up the items Lee requested for research. Marcello decides to give them to Lee himself, as he needs to check something anyway. Cleo is puzzled, but agrees to hand them over. Marcello presents Granfell with the requested items, including those for mana regeneration and various magic texts. However, Granfell finds them all too high level for him. Marcello apologizes for underestimating him, realizing that Granfell likely knew about these items already. He then gives Granfell a hexagram brooch, explaining its properties and expressing admiration for Lee's knowledge. Lee, however, doesn't see the significance of the item. While Granfell silently observes Marcello, Marcello explains that he cannot proceed with the research until he fixes his own magic. Granfell decides to wait for Marcello's call, believing in his ability to overcome his challenges. Marcello appreciates Granfell's support, hoping that together they can bring progress to the Mage's Tower. On the Yusra Archipelago, Huigang streams while waiting for Lee to arrive through the portal. As they discuss Lee's potential arrival, a player named Kinver interrupts, expressing anger at Lee's fame and warning against going overboard. Kinver belongs to the Supernova Guild, known for its ruthless tactics. The chat speculates about Lee's whereabouts and abilities, with some suggesting he may be in hiding due to threats like Kinver. Meanwhile, Granfell and Lee consider whether to explore the Yusra Archipelago. They receive a class quest to inspect the seven deadly sins of Yusra. After some hesitation, Granfell encourages Lee to seize the opportunity. They prepare to embark, with Granfell packing tea bags for the journey. Upon arrival, they sense an overwhelming evil presence on the island. Granfell's natural enemy skill activates, indicating that powerful demons inhabit the area. Despite the danger, they see it as an opportunity, knowing their skill will be constantly active. As they navigate the island, Granfell and Lee remain cautious, searching for weaker opponents due to their low level. Suddenly, Granfell notices something as a group obstructs Huigang's path while they're fighting an Emerald Tiger, a formidable level 420 monster. One of the group members, recognizing Lee, asks why he's there. Lee himself wonders the same thing, intending only to warm up by fighting a scorpion, but encountering the daunting Emerald Tiger instead. Despite the challenging situation, Granfell remains composed. He uses pillars of stone to immobilize the tiger, then employs ignition, creating a powerful fireball that defeats the beast. Hugang's chat explodes with excitement, and Granfell gains some level, while Lee marvels at his perfected ignition ability and the mana-regenerating brooch. Meanwhile, 
Shri, the guild master of the Second Sun Guild, grows frustrated as his team struggles to progress on the island. Realizing their error in splitting up, Shrek resolves to regroup the teams. Upon receiving a call from the West team, who had encountered Lee earlier, Shrek decides it's time to regroup. The West team leader reports Lee's encounter with Marcello and his subsequent quest, prompting Shrek to acknowledge the significance of Lee's actions. Lee rejoices over a rare emerald crystal he finds, planning to request an evaluation from the Mage's Tower for his research. However, Granfell finds Lee's excitement over the crystal pathetic and tries to ignore him. As they contemplate their next move, the ground shakes, and a system message reveals that the archipelago is succumbing to greed. Granfell receives a class quest to prevent the resurrection of the sin of greed, and safeguard the island's treasure from corruption. Amidst the chaos caused by the quest for treasure, players become increasingly greedy, bickering over who should claim it first. Granfell realizes that to prevent the treasure from being corrupted, they must overcome their desire for riches. However, in their current state, this seems impossible. So Lee grapples with his quest to stop the greed-induced frenzy, uncertain of what to do next. Granfell sighs, realizing there's only one solution. He must gather all the tree sure on the island. This confuses Lee, who doesn't understand the urgency. Meanwhile, on another island of the Yusra archipelago, the Shining Guild receives a message about greed. Camilla speculates that each island represents a countdown square, with one square filling up each time treasure is obtained. Despite Dimitri's attempts to focus, Camilla's playful banter about Jesse's crush on Lee persists, much to Dimitri's annoyance. Lee tries to dissuade Granfell from deciding to take all the treasure, fearing it will only expedite the progress of the greed-induced frenzy. They encounter the Lionheart Knights unexpectedly, with Granfell recognizing Lionheart Knight's Captain Harkon. Before they can converse further, they are attacked by the Great Turtle of Golden Canines, the island's protector. Harkon and his men prepare for battle, and Granfell intervenes to save a soldier from danger. Surprisingly, Granfell's use of magic shocks the soldiers, who are unaware of his abilities. As the battle intensifies, Harkon expresses gratitude for Granfell's assistance and offers his help in return. Lee sees an opportunity to gain benefits from assisting the knights, while Granfell views the monsters as natural adversaries, willing to aid in their defeat. Observing from a distance, Hui Gang's chat praises Lee's heroic actions, while the knights charge into battle. Meanwhile, a player questions the wisdom of Harkon's pledge to aid a mere explorer, considering it's typically reserved for royalty. Despite the knights' valor, Lee realizes their melee attacks are ineffective against the massive turtle. Assessing the situation, Lee concludes that the destruction process is advancing faster than anticipated due to the rapid retrieval of treasure. Determined to stop the frenzy, Lee strategizes to maximize the knight's collective attack potential. The ground shakes beneath the great turtle's feet, spewing magma. The knights struggle to evade, but the lack of space hinders them. Granfell recalls the steps from the mage's tower and devises a plan. He constructs a staircase from rocks, astonishing the knights. Lee drained of mana, watches in awe as the knights charge forward under Granfell's guidance. They strike the turtle's head simultaneously, causing it to collapse, and rewards are distributed. Despite not directly damaging the beast, Granfell receives loot and experience. Harkon reveals the significance of Lee's brooch, gifted by an ancient emperor to the mage's tower. Grateful for his aid, the knights pledge allegiance to Lee. Despite Lee's reluctance to take the island's treasure, Granfell claims it to prevent the spread of greed. Unaffected by the allure of wealth due to his upbringing, Granfell acts selflessly. Lee, feeling conflicted about his own greed, witnesses Huigang's admiration and Kinver's ruthlessness. Kinver's brutality reinforces Lee's determination to prevent greed's influence. Granfell unlocks the island's treasure, maintaining selflessness to thwart greed's advance. Lee, disappointed by the treasure's lackluster value, relinquishes his desire for riches. The Lionheart Knights join Granfell's party, pledging loyalty to him. Surprised by their allegiance, Lee recognizes the advantage they bring in battle. Despite his initial skepticism, Lee appreciates the Knights' support on the archipelago. Granfell, seizing the opportunity, urges them to proceed to the next island with determination. Hidden amidst the purple mist and green leaves, Kinver observes Granfell attentively until he's interrupted by a call. The caller expresses concern about the slowed destruction rate after Lee claimed the treasure. They question if Lee truly took it, 
or if it was his NPC companions. Furthermore, they doubt if Harkon and the loyal Lionheart Knights can pose a threat. Kinver dismisses their fears, confident in his plans. He hints at a deadly surprise involving Hydra poison to eliminate Lee and his allies on their journey. However, Kinver suddenly feels a chilling gaze from Lee, leaving him terrified. Despite Granfell and Lee seeing only a harmless squirrel in the place of Kinver, Kinver perceives Lee's bloodlust. As the destruction progresses, Granfell urges Harkel to focus on stopping Greed's spree. Meanwhile, Kinver, overwhelmed by fear, hides and reflects on his actions. He decides to abandon his schemes, fearing Lee's wrath. Back on the radio, Kinver's party members are bewildered over Kinver's abrupt change of heart. In a fit of rage, Hyunjun, one of Kinver's associates, vents his frustration. Accusing his comrades of siding with Kinver, another party member, Hyunjun spirals into a frenzy, demanding to know Kinver's motives. As tension escalates, Granfell senses danger nearby, activating his demon hunter instincts. Meanwhile, Hyunjun's anger reaches a breaking point, leading to a violent outburst against his comrades. Wee Gang watches all of this with a tear in his eye, feeling extremely scared for the demon-possessed person lurking behind him. When he gets the chance, Hui Gang bolts out of there, realizing that the Supernova Guild, known for its ruthless members, could even turn on their own based on unfounded accusations. He needs to leave quickly before he becomes their next target. Suddenly he trips on a branch, but before he falls, someone from the Explorer Alliance stops him and asks if he's okay. They reassure him and offer him a seat to rest for a while. Hui Gang thinks that even someone as reckless as the person who killed his own teammate Ates won't dare to confront the entire Explorer Guild. He accepts their offer, feeling relieved that he's now safe. The Arcana news outlet deployed drones all around the island, broadcasting to everyone around the world. As viewers see, the archipelago is divided into ten islands, each hiding a tree shore waiting to be discovered. The methods to obtain these tree shores vary. One might need to defeat the Eastland owner, a powerful boss monster, or solve a hidden puzzle. Now, they've reached the Finnal Island where numerous players and guilds have gathered. The Shining Guild arrives, having already claimed two treasures, while Gaon and the Inazuma Guild, unable to secure any treasure due to Gaon's actions, also join the fray. The Rising Sun Guild, known rivals of the Berserk Guild, arrives as well, setting the stage for a thrilling final battle. Suddenly, silence falls over the crowd as the mighty Lion Heart Knights make their entrance, led by none other than Granfell. All eyes are on him, noting his confidence and calm demeanor, as if he's certain of claiming the final treasure. Lee, however, feels an overwhelming sense of fear, knowing he's drawn attention to himself. Every player there talks about him, with Camilla declaring she refuses to fight Lee, valuing her life too much. Lee stands behind Granfell, feeling like a frightened cat, wishing everyone would stop staring at him. If they discover his low level, he'll be exposed. Harkon suddenly alerts Lee to danger, and the ground beneath them cracks open, spewing magma as the earth splits apart. From it emerges the island owner, a giant lava koi at level 4 and 20, spreading molten lava in its wake. Players realize they can't attack the beast, shrouded in lava, and focus on coordination instead. Even Taman, renowned for his skills, struggles to approach. As the news outlet records the event from above, the koi creates a pool of lava around itself, making it impossible for anyone to get close. Harkon apologizes to Lee, unable to fulfill his promise to be his sword against such a formidable foe. However, Granfell remains composed, revealing he has a plan. He manipulates the lava, lifting it effortlessly, leaving everyone in awe. With the path to the island owner now open, Harkon charges forward, urging others to follow suit. Despite the daunting challenge, the players rally, charging towards the koi fish. But just as they approach, the koi leaps into the air, crashing back down with immense force, sending everyone reeling from the impact. Lee notices the fish's movements, warning others to be cautious as it prepares to jump again. The news outlet predicts a lengthy and perilous battle due to the fish's immense power. Suddenly, the once liquid lava solidifies into spears, striking the fish. Everyone gazes at Lee in amazement as such a transformation seems impossible within the system's mana limits. Granfell orders Harkon to attack, and with a single powerful blow, Harkon defeats the fish. Players receive a notification confirming the fish's defeat, 
with Locks feeling embarrassed that their top guild made no contribution. The news outlet celebrates the victory, declaring Lee and the Lionheart Knights as the top contributors. Lee appears relaxed, but in reality he's exhausted and drained of mana, struggling to remain conscious. As the island's treasure materializes before Granfell, everyone watches eagerly. However, when Granfell opens it, the destruction progress rate doesn't appear immediately, surprising everyone. Eventually, it does, raising questions about whether there are more treasures or if the delay was intentional. Despite the shiny blue treasure, Lee senses a powerful demonic presence, indicating another treasure succumbed to greed. Meanwhile, the Explorer Guild and Huiging witness Hyunjin's betrayal, horrified as he slaughters NPCs and claims an island treasure. Unable to confront Hyunjin's overwhelming power, they watch in despair. Hyunjin grapples with his conscience, tormented by his actions and the demonic influence. The demon reassures him, claiming to have aided him as promised. Now, it's Hyunjin's turn to fulfill his end of the bargain. A Lionheart Knight intervenes, pushing Hyunjin back and checking on Hui Gang's safety. Lee, detecting a foul odor emanating from the demon, makes an entrance. Suddenly, Granfell receives a class quest, and Hyunjin succumbs further to demonic influence. The system warns of the archipelago's imminent destruction, terrifying everyone except Granfell. The Eastland's Treasure, corrupted by greed, shatters above Hyunjung, turning him into a soulless puppet. With the destruction meter full, Lee confirms the inevitable destruction. As the destruction begins, a colossal hand emerges, breaking apart the islands and merging them into one. Reporters, visibly shaken, observe the chaos. Suddenly, a massive golden castle materializes, surprising even Harkon. While some players see it as another treasure, Granfell recognizes it as the Castle of Greed, home to one of the deadly sins. Granfell receives a quest notification, indicating the quest was paused, surprising him as he thought it had failed. Harkon urgently alerts everyone to prepare for battle as vengeful undead emerges from the ground, hungry for flesh. Reporters initially excited by the spectacle soon realize the severity of the situation when they receive distressing news on their phones. Meanwhile, chaos ensues at the Arcana building as employees scramble to respond to the crisis. Granfell examines the updates, revealing the boss monster greed to be level 650, with zombies at level 500. While others engage in battle, Granfell finds himself annoyed by the constant barrage of class quests. Despite the daunting challenge ahead, Granfell marches forward, pondering the seemingly impossible quest. He approaches Harkon, questioning whether their previous oath remains valid. Granfell emphasizes the necessity of depending on Harkon in such dire circumstances. Harkon, surprised but determined, agrees to stand by Granfell's side. While Harkon rallies the Lion Knights, Lee grapples with fear. Nevertheless, Harkon reaffirms their commitment to aiding Granfell in defeating the evil threatening the island. Witnessing this resolve, including Hang, they prepare to confront the undead horde guarding the castle. Grandfell commands the charge, drawing attention from both the spectators and the Arcana building. Despite the initial shock, the country watches in awe as they witness this legendary moment unfold. As the battle ensues, Grandfell and Lee observe the Lionheart Knight's exceptional performance. Lee's mana reserves are in the process of replenishing, allowing them to contribute soon effectively. However, their focus is interrupted when Shrake's guild members pressure him to join the fight. Shrake resists, knowing the futility of engaging in such a perilous mission. The undead rise once more, posing a threat that Granfell struggles to combat with his depleted mana. However, a ray of hope emerges as Leone and Taman arrive unexpectedly to aid Lee. Surprised by the unplanned assistance, they form a temporary alliance to confront the common enemy. Reporters note the unexpected alliance, speculating on its significance. Meanwhile, Lee questions their intentions, only for Granfell to assert their assistance unequivocally, albeit brusquely. Leone, expressing gratitude, acknowledges their debt to Lee, prompting Granfell's reluctant acceptance of their aid. Chilman tells his brother that seizing this opportunity to impress Lee and grow closer to him is crucial. With shared intentions, they both cast a manic glance at Lee, a matter of indifference to Granfell. As the undead rise once more, the battle recommences, with Taman summoning his saints for blessings and protection against the relentless foes. Lee worries about his contribution rate being affected, prompting him to boost the Lion Knight's abilities. Granfell approaches Leonie, lacking his usual tea to offer her, 
but demanding buffs for the Lionheart Knights. This surprises Leonie, and Lee apologizes for the brusque request. Unexpectedly, the Gaon Saints bestow blessings upon the Knights, inciting frustration from Leonie, and congratulations from Taemin for the swift action. Empowered by the blessings, the Knights charge forward with renewed confidence to fulfill their oath. Granfil expresses gratitude to Taemin, promising to remember the assistance. Taemin, eager to provide further aid, offers divine blessings and protections, but Granfell dismisses the notion, rejecting the concept of faith in God. As Granfell walks away, Lee is left embarrassed by the interaction. Meanwhile, Harkon, overhearing Granfell's remark, is surprised, but suddenly recalls his past beliefs and a promise he made to his king long ago. This memory stirs conflicting emotions within him, as dark hands from the castle's doors begin to envelop him in a sinister energy. Harkon reminisces about the past, recalling his commitment to confront the demons threatening their world. Despite his king's loss of faith, Harkon remains steadfast in his belief in God and the necessity of defeating the demons to reconnect with the divine. He leads his knights into battle against the commanding general of the demon army, determined to fulfill his promise to his king. During the brutal battle, Harkon's troops suffer heavy casualties. Despite their valiant efforts, they are abruptly transported to Earth, where they find themselves amidst the chaos of battle-worn soldiers being photographed. Confused yet resolute, Harkon is driven by the vision of his king and his promise to return to him. Consumed by the dark energy, Harkon is compelled by the vision of his king, vowing to become his sword once again and vanquish their enemies. Lee observes Harkon's transformation with astonishment, recognizing the danger of his possession. As Harkon advances, his soldiers question the situation, while Lini grows increasingly frustrated by the unfolding events. Lee realizes the gravity of the situation, understanding that Harkon's possession poses a significant challenge, likely involving mind control. Amidst the chaos of battle, Lee grapples with the realization that the continent's strongest knight has fallen under sinister influence. In an instant, Harkon vanishes from sight, reappearing behind Granfell, poised to strike. Before he can act, Taemin intervenes, knocking Harkon away and checking on Granfell's well-being. Surprised by Granfell's stern glare instead of gratitude, Taemin faces criticism from his brother Shaman for his excessive force, which leaves Lee in a state of shock from nearly being killed. Regaining his composure, Lee resolves to thank Taemin later, and observes Harkon being pushed back by Enoch, who urges him to awaken and return with them to their king. Enraged by Enoch's remarks, Harkon perceives them as demons and prepares to attack, ignoring pleas from Enoch and Jessica to resist the darkness. Lee notices a strange light as Harko charges forward, unleashing a devastating attack that sends shockwaves through the area, injuring many and leaving devastation in its wake. As survivors are attended to by healers, Granfell is recognized for his extraordinary ability to halt Harkon's assault with a single gesture, eliciting awe from all present. Harkon, intrigued by Granfell's pure aura amidst the chaos, demands an explanation of his identity or faces death. Granfell, unsure himself, suspects his role as a demon hunter might be influencing the situation. Unable to articulate a response due to shock, Granfell gestures towards Harkon's brooch, triggering memories of their past interactions and Granfell's heroic actions. Realizing Granfell's true intentions, Harkon sees Lee's true form, and is relieved to understand that Granfell is not a threat, but a friend. As Harkon attempts to warn Granfell of the encroaching evil energy, he himself is consumed and transported elsewhere. In this new realm, he encounters a solitary figure seated on a simple throne, Greed, one of the seven deadly sins. Lee recognizes this as Harkon's mental realm, where Greed recounts the tragic history of the Usra kingdom, once prosperous and peaceful, until an invasion brought devastation and ruin. The king questioned the invaders' motives, suggesting they could have shared the jewels peacefully. However, they dismissed sharing as cowardly, believing they could take everything by force. This mindset led the king to embody greed, claiming ownership of the island, the sea, and the sky. Granfell interrupted his monologue, mocking greed's dramatics over material possessions, considering greed's vast wealth. Granfell asserted that true wealth lies in intangible values, like pride, which greed could never steal. With a surge of energy, Granfell shattered the illusionary world, prompting Harkon to check on him. Ignoring the concern, Granfell focused on disrupting the palace's foundation, causing it to crumble. Witnessing his power, everyone marveled at Granfell's strength. 
Despite their dwindling mana, Granfell challenged Greed to face him, emphasizing the futility of his wealth and the sacrifices made by his soldiers. Greed, revealing his true form, threatened to turn them all into undead soldiers to guard his treasures indefinitely. As the dark energy enveloped them, Taman prepared to resist, but Granfell intervened, dispelling the darkness. Defiantly, Granfell declared his resistance to Greed's mind control. Utilizing his upgraded exorcism skill, Granfell protected his alias from further influence. Identifying himself as the last king of the Usra Kingdom, Granfell urged Greed to relinquish his hold and atone for his sins. Greed, initially dismissive, realized the futility of his resistance and exploded in defeat. With Greed vanquished, the king of the Usra Kingdom surrendered to Granfell, bewildered by his presence. Attempting to communicate, the king found himself drowned out by Granfell's constant level-ups and a hidden quest timer. Despite the chaos, Granfell and the king discovered the broken crown, an item from the Islands Trisur. Presenting it to the king, Granfell triggered a transformation, fulfilling the conditions of a secret quest. Huigeng's chat exploded as everyone receives a rar world with a message, signaling the unveiling of the ancient kingdom of Usra. The ground turns blue as the kingdom emerges, stunning everyone with its beauty. Reporters focus on Granfell and a mysterious man, sensing their importance. Granfell, observing the glowing king, leaves Lee wondering about the sudden event. The king, named Hakuna, bows to Granfell, expressing gratitude for saving the kingdom. Despite the surprise, Granfell introduces himself casually as Lee, shocking everyone with his informality. Hakuna asks for Granfell's name formally, promising to remember it for generations. Despite the king's formal speech, Granfell's casual demeanor remains unchanged. Hakuna reveals that Greed's defeat was a result of Granfell's actions, which he cringes at. He shares similarities with Harkum's former king, recognizing Granfell's elegance. Wondering why he was rescued, Hakuna expresses his desire to rebuild the kingdom. Granfell Reading a quest window suggests reconstructing the kingdom to help Hakuna regain his pride. Shrike's guild rushes to the kingdom, driven by greed for profit. Granfell offers to aid in rebuilding, surprising everyone, including Hakuna. Shrike's arrival prompts agreement to assist in reconstruction. As Shrike attempts to befriend Lee, Granfell, struggling to focus, finds his enthusiasm irritating. Despite Harkon's intervention, Granfell ignores him and makes an offer to Hakuna, watched eagerly by everyone including reporters. Later, at the Berserker headquarters, Leone reads about the collaboration between Gaian and Berserker to rebuild Usra. Harkon stays behind, while Shrake is ridiculed and ignored, leading to laughter among the members. At the Gaion headquarters, Chilman celebrates his brother's achievement, eager to embark on the rebuilding quest. Despite Taman's reluctance, Chilman is overjoyed, recognizing the significance of the task. Members rejoice not just for the quest but also for witnessing the first kingdom to emerge since Arcana's reality update. Once the reconstruction of the kingdom is complete, its value will skyrocket. Many people, including Shri, are eager to establish connections with the kingdom due to its significance as the world's first national scale update. Additionally, the kingdom boasts abundant resources, enhancing its potential. Those who accumulate enough influence and affinity with the kingdom may even earn noble titles after the reconstruction. In another location, numerous players rush towards Lee, each motivated by their own reasons, primarily greed. Lee evades them by hiding in a nearby wall, feeling utterly exhausted. He contemplates whether to take a nap at the Mag's Tower instead. Suddenly, Jesse appears before him, startling Lee but leaving Granfell unfazed. Jesse clumsily practices a Korean greeting she learned, which Granfell appreciates despite his fatigue. He invites her to sit down, apologizing for lacking tea, as rocket shipping to the Mag's Tower is unavailable. Jesse offers to protect him from potential danger, but Granfell, feeling even wearier, urges her to get to the point. Jesse begins discussing the magic Granfell used, causing his exhaustion to deepen as her words blend together. As Lee drifts into sleep, Jesse notices his discomfort and adjusts his hair. When Granfell awakens, he questions whether their conversation was a dream, but finds a letter left by Jesse. Despite feeling rude for falling asleep, Granfell realizes that the Marcello research quest has appeared, 
signaling a new challenge to convince the senior mages. Although Granfell expected a test upon entering the mag's tower, he wonders why it occurs when they are both exhausted. After resting briefly, Marcello arrives, expressing his purpose to Granfell, who anticipates the need to prove himself. Meanwhile, senior mage Bella Yusia doubts Lee's qualifications, believing he cannot bypass the three-tier ceiling magic, protecting the room. Bala eagerly awaits Lee's failure, but to her astonishment, he effortlessly breaks through the magic barrier, surprising everyone present. Granfell, sensing trickery, confronts Balia, who realizes her mistake. As they awaken from their brief slumber, Lee decides he needs immediate rest. Granfell warns the mages that their games will not be tolerated in the future. Despite Balia's amusement at Granfell's dismissal of the spell, the mages acknowledge that three out of the twenty have accepted Lee. They both feel that the number of senior mages accepting Granfell is fewer than expected, but it's all right since they are all highly skilled in their respective magic disciplines. Having three senior mages acknowledge him just for opening a door is considered a decent achievement. Besides, Granfell, being a demon hunter, isn't in a hurry to impress these individuals. As they contemplate sleeping, a magical parchment bearing Marcello's face appears, summoning Granfell. Marcello explains that it's a useful messaging tool used by mages, allowing them to communicate by speaking to the parchment. Though hesitant, Granfell eventually speaks into the parchment, only for Marcello to joke about the proximity, causing Granfell to accidentally drop it in the garbage. Marcello apologizes for the prank, expressing disapproval of the Crystal Hall incident. He clarifies that head mages must continually prove themselves, regardless of their magical prowess. Granfell, accustomed to such tests, reassures Marcello, who worries about being underestimated. Granfell's response, however, follows a predictable pattern that Lee finds cringe. He emphasizes that underestimation motivates him to prove himself, while overestimation drives him to surpass expectations. Marcello expresses regret for not addressing Granfell in person and resolves to visit immediately. Lee despairs at the prospect of further delay to his rest. Granfell muses that they'll only get to sleep when they're dead. Despite being a beginner mage at level 226, far below the senior mage's level of at least 600, Granfell refuses to succumb to despair. He sees disproving underestimation and exceeding overestimation as significant accomplishments. Granfell showcases his magical prowess by conjuring enchanting scenery, a source of pride for both him and Marcello. However, using excessive magic leaves them feeling faint. Upon Marcello's arrival, Granfell welcomes him despite their exhausted state. Meanwhile, at a construction site, Taman and Chaelman observe the widespread skepticism among the people, puzzled by its cause. Inside the room, Marcello notices traces of recent magic, prompting Granfell to admit to some basic magical practice. However, Marcello is concerned about the abundance of magical traces, which indicate recent spellcasting. Cleo joins them, admiring the beautiful traces, attracting more mages eager to analyze them. Lee and Granfell wonder about the sudden influx of people. Marcello attributes the impressive traces to Lee, but when he attempts to introduce him, Lee flees, fearing the relentless pursuit of the mage enthusiasts. Lee rushes away, desperate to escape the relentless attention of the magical community. Unfortunately for him, a quirky group of mages intercepts Granfell, presenting him with a Rubik's Cube challenge. Boasting about its difficulty, the current record stands at a staggering nine days. Unfazed, Granfell swiftly completes the puzzle with reversal magic, then continues down the stairs. A quest notification appears, indicating four more mages convinced by his actions making Granfell think the task might be easier than expected. However, his moment of relief is short-lived as a horde of reporters awaits him at the bottom of the stairs, bombarding him with questions about the controversies surrounding him. Granfell dismisses their inquiries as rude and refuses to entertain their moronic questions. To make matters worse, the mages join in with their own questions, trapping Granfell in a tense situation. Feeling overwhelmed, Lee and Granfell spot a change in the mana flow on a nearby wall and seize the opportunity to escape. They leap through the wall, disappearing from sight, much to the chagrin of their pursuers. They find themselves in Bella's office, who had anticipated their arrival and opened the door for them. Granfell clarifies that he sensed the mana disturbance in the wall, similar to how he detected the Tower Master's grand illusion and restored it to its original state. 
Amidst the chaos, Bia bursts into laughter, recalling Granfell's speech about being underestimated, much to Lee's embarrassment. However, Blee, the head mage of the healing school, acknowledges Granfell's abilities, bringing the total number of supportive mages to eight. Finally returning home, Lee reads the reports about him, relieved to find them filled with baseless gossip. The Gown and Berserker guilds come to his defense, confirming his individual achievements. Yet, the burning question remains, why aren't they sleeping yet? Their relentless completion of class quests has boosted their stamina and agility points significantly, putting them ahead of their peers by a considerable margin. While Lee ponders the usefulness of these skills to a demon hunter, he also reminisces about the combat techniques of Sword Aura from Harkon. Meanwhile, Granfell's attempt at cooking ends disastrously when he unintentionally destroys the kitchen sink by manifesting Sword Aura. In another part of the world, Leone from the Uzra Berserker Reconstruction Unit watches videos on her phone, growing increasingly frustrated with the baseless accusations against Lee. Despite her guild's reassurance, Leone's anger stems from the unfair treatment of someone who single-handedly defeated a powerful adversary. Her guildmates tease her about having a crush on Lee, causing her to blush furiously. However, they ultimately remind her that the gossip will fade away, focusing instead on the potential benefits of the reconstruction quest for their guild's influence and resources. Unfortunately for Granfell, a group of guards stationed at the entrance of the Uzra Kingdom halt his progress, explaining that entry is restricted to those with permission. They inquire if he possesses a permit or is a resident, to which Granfell replies in the negative. Lee assumes the guard must be one of the Arcanians who recently relocated, pleased to see him enjoying his new role. Despite Granfell's request to send a message or seek an alternative way to meet Harkon, the guard dismisses him, insisting on formalities and deeming him unfit to meet such an important figure. Unexpectedly, Hakuna arrives and warmly greets Lee, instantly changing the guard's demeanor. With Hakuna's authority activated, Granfell gains access to the kingdom. Hakuna questions Granfell's purpose, and Granfell explains his intention to meet with Harkon. Hakuna expresses surprise at the need for permission, asserting that as a king, Granfell should have unrestricted access. Undeterred, Granfell proceeds to his meeting. Elsewhere, on a picturesque beach, Jessica trains the Lion Knights while Granfell converses with Harkon, expressing a desire to master the sword. He emphasizes the need for better control, citing his ability to wield it. Harkon, taken aback, explains that swordsmanship requires extensive training, especially for a mage like Granfell. Nonetheless, he instructs Jessica to bring a sword and the Lion Knight's oath. Jessica returns with the items, including the oath, a significant relic symbolizing their commitment. Harkon tasks Granfell with etching a third slash on the stone if he can truly manifest the sword. Despite objections from Enoch, Jessica intervenes, believing it to be part of their leader's plan. Granfell opts for a training sword instead of Haram's legendary blade, surprising the onlookers. Granfell demonstrates his sword aura, striking the slab with immense force, cracking it. Although impressed, Harkon notices Granfell's drained HP and orders him not to use the sword until permitted. Harkon acknowledges Granfell's potential and assigns Jessica and Enoch to train him, emphasizing the importance of mastering the basics under their guidance. Despite trembling with excitement, Granfell accepts the challenge, ready to embark on his swordsmanship journey with his newfound mentors. However, he must refrain from using the sword until granted permission. Lee and Granfell are relieved as they realize they need to grasp the basics. Granfell begins basic training, much to Enoch's discontent, who sees no reason for a mage to learn swordsmanship. However, he respects the captain's authority and refrains from interfering. Jessica, the instructor, warns the trainees of the rigorous training ahead and sends them to change into training attire. She particularly considers Lee's situation, although he can manifest the sword, lacking stamina could hinder its use in critical situations. As Granfell returns, Jessica admires his physique, blushing slightly. She instructs the trainees to hold their swords while Enoch corrects their form. Since most trainees are novices, they pay little attention to Granfell. Reflecting on Harkon's swordsmanship during their duel, Granfell grasps the technique and unleashes a powerful strike, leaving everyone astonished. Enoch curies his method, and Granfell attributes it to mimicking Harkon's style. Impressed, Jessica acknowledges Granfell's extraordinary talent, 
realizing he is not merely lucky, but a true genius. Observing from afar, Harkon recognizes Lee's potential and resolves to guide him through his talents. Meanwhile, Hakuna, concerned about Lee's well-being, orders the removal of sand from the beach to prevent respiratory issues. He then arranges for trees to provide shade, demonstrating his care for Lee's health. Inspired by Hakuna's compassion, Harkon joins the training, shedding his armor to participate as a new recruit. To alleviate pressure, Harkon invites Lee, Jessica, and Enoch to join. Lee warmly accepts, causing discomfort for Jessica and Enoch. Despite the awkwardness, they persevere through the session. At the Mage Tower, Mathis Carl, known for advancing black magic, receives Lee's items for appraisal. Recognizing their dark nature, Mathis decides to write to Lee, requesting further details. As the night training concludes, Grandfell continues exercising, much to Lee's chagrin. He attributes the intense regimen to Harkon's influence, who suggested extensive laps. Mathis identifies the items. A vampire orb, a rare tool used by demons, a pure emerald crystal with vitality-restoring properties, and coiscale silk, a valuable material. Mathis requests to borrow a few items for research, but Granfell declines most of them and grants permission for the useless ones, instead requesting a handkerchief made from crystal and silk. Mathis agrees to appraise Lee's items, but it requires some funds, which Granfell is willing to provide for the best results. Impressed, Mathis starts discussing but finds Granfell asleep, much to his frustration. Leaving a message for a dawn meeting in the floating garden, Mathis tries to contact Granfell again, but receives no response. Relieved that he hasn't offended Granfell, Mathis continues to extend the invitation, but Granfell declines each time, prioritizing his sword training over personal meetings. Mathis perceives it as a test of etiquette, but fails to convince Granfell otherwise. Eventually, Granfell allocates an hour for a meeting, coinciding with their initial plan. Meanwhile, Harkon observes Lee's dedication to swordsmanship and decides he's reached a stage where he can only learn through real combat. Surprised by the abrupt end to his training, Lee and Granfell express concern. Harkon believes Lee underestimates himself and instructs him to demonstrate his aura again. Granfell, contemplating the sword aura's nature, suddenly realizes its similarity to mana, enabling him to stabilize it using magic principles. Impressed by his mental commitment, Harkon invites Lee to pursue the path of the sword repeatedly, although Granfell refuses. As Lee walks through the forest, he encounters a formidable level 300 silver mane leopard. Despite his fear, Granfell activates his sword aura, ready to fight. Nearby, Kichi, a mercenary captain, observes the confrontation but opts not to intervene, considering the leopard too powerful. As the leopard attacks, Lee prepares for the worst, apologizing to his family. However, Granfell swiftly strikes the leopard despite the level difference, showcasing the power of the sword aura. Exhausted, Lee urges Granfell to rest. Meanwhile, at the floating garden, Matisse awaits Lee, curious about the renowned figure. Upon Lee's arrival, Matisse senses an unusual vibration, indicating Lee's extraordinary nature. Despite their tired muscles from intense training, Lee and Granfell exchange greetings. As they discuss, Matisse's rings, designed to detect black magic, glow with an unfamiliar color, prompting concern. Unsure how to proceed, Granfell and Lee await further developments, while Lee eagerly awaits a seat. In the past, Matisse faced bullying for his studies in dark arts. He strongly believed that all types of magic deserved exploration. Presenting his findings on the usefulness of dark magic to the Great Hall, Mathis hoped to address issues of worldview interference. However, he was met with ridicule and rejection. Despite naming his magic Black Magic, acceptance was short-lived, as he couldn't solve the worldview interference problem. The manifestation of the Mage's Tower on Earth due to worldview interference left Mathis living in shame. Now, encountering someone with an exceptional sensitivity to black magic, Mathis sees a chance to achieve what he couldn't alone. Despite his limited time, Granfell invites Mathis to sit and enjoy tea. Mathis explains that his rings detect black magic sensitivity, revealing the depth of a person's talent. Black magic, unlike regular magic, taps into inner darkness as mana. Lee realizes Granfell's dark past might contribute to his strong black mana. However, he finds asking about someone's past etiquette lacking. 
apologizing for any offense, Matisse offers to report himself for judgment. Granfell accepts the apology, appreciating Matisse's scholarly dedication to black magic research. Intrigued by the uniqueness of black magic, Granfell expresses interest in its potential use when regular mana is depleted. Mathis suggests Granfell walk the path of dark magic, impressed by his commitment. Returning to his laboratory, Granfell completes quests from various mages, earning relationship status within the magic tower. Though Lee finds the rewards useful, Granfell remains focused on researching a new system function. Meanwhile, news highlights the rebuilding efforts of the Berserker and Gaon guilds in the Usra Kingdom. Observing the news, Cholman and Taman acknowledge their debt to Lee for his assistance. They recognize that Lee's support has propelled their guild's rise. Reading about mythology's involvement in the business world, they ponder the National Assembly's priorities. Wondering about the sources of their wealth, they find it mysterious. Elsewhere, a member of the National Assembly falls under Bayek Yisiel's bewitchment, while Yisiel prepares to visit the Mage's Tower. Granfell, bombarded with messages, decides to ignore them and heads to the Usra Kingdom. Hakuna assures Lee not to be bothered by others' insincerity, suggesting it's their way of expressing gratitude. Granfell, disliking bribes, reflects on his victory over the cardinal sin. Did he really see that video where he defeated Greed? It's the first he's hearing of it. But before he can check, his third sister calls, mocking him with cringy words he said to Hakuna. Granfell thanks them and ends the call. Afterward, he seeks a place to rest, finding solace in a quiet spot. While searching for the video, he contemplates suing for its unauthorized use. However, he senses something strange in the air and decides to clean up. At the Gaon Reconstruction Base, Taemin is alarmed to find their stock plummeting due to rumors spread by mythology. Tensions rise, as Chaelman suggests, mythology wants to share the Uzra Reconstruction Quest. Meanwhile, Yisiel's actions cause suspicion, leading Cheolman to realize she's using mind domination magic, as Granfell arrives and appears to confront Yisiel. Despite Taman's attempts to explain, Granfell shows him the video of his battle with the Cardinal Sin, condemning Yisiel for her actions. Ignoring Yisiel's attempts to manipulate him, Granfell discusses the false rumors with Cholin. Cheolman explains they uploaded the video to counter the rumors apologizing for any embarrassment it caused Granfell. Yiseol tries to interject, but Granfell asserts his conversation with Cholan takes precedence. Yiseol, undeterred, tries to seduce Granfell, using her charm skill on him. However, Granfell resists, disgusted by Yiseol's behavior. As the streamers exploit the situation for fame and money, Granfell expresses his disdain. Yiseol, Feigning restraint suggests they continue their conversation elsewhere, confident they can discuss matters freely. Granfell immediately rejects Yisael's advances, surprising both her and the viewers. He insists that if she wants to talk, she should schedule an appointment like a civilized person. The streamers record the encounter eagerly, titling it Yisael vs. Lee. Yisael, known as South Korea's top corporate leader and the daughter of the mythology corporation's head, commands a massive following and sets trends effortlessly. Despite her usual success, her attempts to seduce Lee fail spectacularly, leading to widespread embarrassment. Frustrated and enraged, Yisiel vents her anger in front of a shattered mirror, vowing revenge against Lee. However, her reflection reminds her of the pact she made for salvation and revenge. Yisiel realizes she's been manipulated and inflicted with self-harm. In desperation, she stabs herself repeatedly while her inner voice questions her motives. Despite her wealth and fame, Yisiel feels empty and inadequate without her powerful position. As Yisiel's inner turmoil intensifies, she realizes she's not in control and confronts her fear of being alone. In a desperate act, she stabs herself in the stomach, seeking solace and revenge against Lee. After leaving her apartment, she absorbs energy from a guard, returning to her original form. Meanwhile, Granfell relaxes at his Uzra home when his natural enemy skill alerts him to an intruder. He sarcastically comments on the rudeness of sneaking into someone's home, uninvited but welcomes the unexpected visitor nonetheless. Lee waits patiently, assuming it's safe since even demons wouldn't dare to visit at such a late hour. Suddenly, the succubus enters through the window, congratulating Lee on his vigilance. Granfell questions her lack of manners as she apologizes for her forgetfulness. 
Granfell gazes deeply at the succubus, but senses that the real Yi Seol is no longer present. He speculates that she might have perished, possibly from shock-induced self-harm. The succubus mocks Yi Seol's demise, attributing it to her own foolishness and insignificance. Yi Seol's troubled past is revealed, marked by media ridicule, bullying, and the loss of her mother to suicide. Despite her hardships, Yi Seol's father reluctantly took her in, but his harsh words further wounded her. The succubus laughs maniacally, <laughs> finding Yi Seol's tragic history amusing. Yi Seol's life as a player was one of obedience, driven by a desperate desire for acceptance and love. However, her attempts at revenge and repayment ended in failure, highlighting her naivety. Granfell's demeanor shifts as he commands the succubus to silence her disrespectful laughter. He admonishes her arrogance and dismisses her as prey. Lee finds himself transported to a scene from Granfell's past, witnessing moments of familial bliss and devastating loss. He empathizes with Granfell's anguish and understands his vow to eradicate demons. Granfell confronts the succubus, condemning her for mocking human pride and resilience. Unable to defend herself, the succubus submits to her fate, acknowledging the weight of her sins. With a decisive blow, Granfell ends her existence. Yseol, now returned, weeps at Granfell's words, prompting him to suggest she leave and find solace elsewhere. Exhausted, she falls asleep, leaning on him. Granfell, noting her lack of injuries from the succubus's actions, concludes that she must be simply fatigued. He arranges her comfortably before the door bursts open, revealing lion knights who mistake the situation, assuming Granfell and Yseol are having a romantic encounter. Despite his attempts to explain, the misunderstanding persists, leaving both Granfell and Lee drained. Amidst the confusion, Granfell receives a new clash quest, feeling apprehensive about it. Meanwhile, an update introducing the Northern City Frost is announced, met with enthusiasm from players and streamers alike. The prospect of exploring Frost's vast shops and accommodations excites everyone, signaling positive anticipation for the new update. Lee feels a growing sense of unease upon receiving a class quest related to Frost and the Demon King present in it. He urges Granfell to warn others on the forums, but Granfell dismisses the gravity of the situation. Demon Kings are formidable adversaries for demon hunters, as Granfell recalls from his training days. He emphasizes the importance of preparation and study to face such powerful foes. While Lee sees the quest as unproductive, Granfell values the knowledge gained. Lee's concern is momentarily interrupted by a comment on Granfell's warning post, advising caution regarding NPCs due to the presence of a Demon King. Despite the warning, Lee reassures himself that Frost is a safe, bustling city where even a Demon King would struggle to cause harm. However, embarrassment soon overwhelms him, and he succumbs to shame. A bird bearing a delivery from the Mage's Tower interrupts their discussion. Lee receives items he had long requested including a ring that regenerates HP when attacked, and a handkerchief enhancing fire affinity and evasion. Overwhelmed by their quality and likely cost, Lee worries about payment and his financial future. Unlocking the aesthetic stat, Lee adjusts his points towards luck while Granfell explores the items further. Their class quest is postponed due to a prior task at the Inazuma Guild, where the main player faces criticism for the guild's poor performance against Gaon. The guild leader vows to rectify the situation, emphasizing the need to strengthen their influence in Frost, despite uncertainties surrounding its safety. The decision to withhold entry to Frost prompts speculation and rumors. Frost, once a thriving city, now appears desolate and dangerous. As the Inazuma Guild ventures inside, they encounter devastation and are besieged by powerful demons, signaling impending peril. Meanwhile, at the gate near Hokkaido, the Gaon Guild faces rejection due to the lack of a passport, a fate shared by others seeking entry. Inside Frost, the Inazuma Guild confronts grim scenes of death and demonic attacks, highlighting the city's transformation into a perilous realm. The revelation of Frost's dire condition underscores the urgent need for action and the impending threat to all who dare to enter. A few hours before the assault on Inazuma, Yisiel wakes up in Lee's room at Yusra and freaks out upon realizing that she is still alive. Upon noticing that she is in Lee's room, she starts worrying if she has caused him trouble, because not only he had to save her life, but to let her rest on his bed. 
Lee reads a status window telling him to reclaim the burning frost that's been overtaken by demons, and the insufficient gauge will cause failure. Lee isn't able to see any gauge, so he believes that a gauge will show up once he enters frost. Yisiel shows her gratitude to Lee for saving her life and offers to repay her in any way. Lee takes out the manufacturing fee envelope and plans for Yisiel to pay for the manufacturing fee. However, when he opens the envelope, he finds out that the manufacturing is free. Harkon and King Hakuna show up in Lee's room to discuss a concerning matter. Harkon teases Lee upon seeing Yi Seol in his room while King complains about Yi Seol intruding into Yusra without permission. King grants Lee permission to handle the situation related to Yi Seol himself, and Lee asks her to return to her home. Yi Seol is impressed that not only Lee is strong, but even King Hakuna and Harkon speak formally to him. Lee asks Yi Seol for a favor for Yusra, which she easily agrees. As Yi Seol contemplates her next meeting with Lee, a class quest notification window shows up prompting Lee to decide to leave urgently. King Hakuna and Harkon are shocked to see Lee leaving somewhere in the middle of the night and ask for the reason for his sudden departure. Lee reveals to them that there is a demon king in Frost, shocking everyone in the room. Meanwhile, Taman gets furious for not getting permission to enter Japan. He worries about Hisagi's safety because he hasn't returned from Frost yet. Lox approaches the soldiers blocking the border and tells them that their action violates the AAU agreement. Soon the soldiers receive a call and break the formation of guarding the border. Hisagi loses his men one after another and fears a total annihilation of his guild when suddenly Lee, with Harkon and Taman show up for help. Harkon's knights appear behind Lee and soon a fight ensues between the knights and the demons. When Lee watches a large amount of demons present in Frost, he acknowledges that he could have died had he come along to fight the demons. In a flashback from a few hours earlier, Lee wants to hurry and go to Frost to help Inazuma, but King Hakuna and Harkon stop him, warning him about a potential life threat. King Hakuna shows his desire to gather a unit to support Lee but since Lee is in a hurry, Harkon once again vows to become his sword and accompany him to Frost. By looking at Lee's resolve and anger toward demons, he is compelled to assist Lee till the end. Back to the present in Frost. Hisagi sees Lee with Harkon and Taman tells him that he should be thankful to Lee since he ordered the rescue of the survivors as an utmost priority. Harkon's knights defeat all the demons in front of the southern wall of Frost Castle, leaving the action in the hands of Lee, who is going to do something extraordinary as usual. He suddenly raises his hand filled with mana, and through his beautiful light magic, destroys all the gates of the castle. Lox now thinks that Lee is a monster to hold such power, and also acknowledges his superiority over him. As soon as the castle gates open, everyone gets a siege assault, quest window that holds a mission to recapture Frost, since it has fallen into the hands of a demon king. Lox tells his guildmates that this is a field quest that will guarantee them valuable contribution points. He opts to go for the western gate thinking that the southern gate is already occupied by Lee. Meanwhile, Harkon is stunned to witness another of Lee's displays of power, and sweats like a horse upon watching all the gates of the castle destroyed in an instant. Harkon wants Lee's permission to fight on the front line while charging into the castle, but Lee stops him stating that he feels something ominous inside the castle, as an unpleasant energy coming out of the castle is getting thicker and thicker. Taman does the same, but before Lee is able to warn him, he rushes toward the southern gate, where multiple demons are waiting to ambush him. Demons suddenly appear coming out of the gate and capture Taiman dragging him inside the castle when Jessica suddenly frees him from the clutches of the demons. Taiman notices that Jessica holds a similar technique to his own, which is based on the barbarian class. Soon, Taiman and Jessica are surrounded by more demons which are then neutralized by Kichi and her unit that were sent to help Lee as a backup from King Hakuna. With this unexpected help, Harkon joins the fight while Kichi's unit transfers all of their contribution points to Lee, which shocks him. Kichi greets Harkon thinking he is the commander, but when she learns that Lee is leading the whole assault, she contemplates getting closer to Lee and gets to his good side for ulterior motives. However, as soon as she sees Lee's face, she realizes that he is the same person she left at the mercy of a dangerous level 300 monster without helping him. The broadcast announces the locations of all the main guilds on four of the castle walls. Unified, under the Heaven Guild is fighting the Eastern Gate, Berserker Guild is fighting the Northern Gate, Lox is fighting at the Western Gate, while Lee, Harkon, Gaon, 
and shadow mercenary troops under Kichi's leadership are fighting at the southern gate. Li finds shadow mercenary troops very helpful and starts developing high regard for them, while Kichi appears scared of the fact Li might recognize her. A shadow mercenary mage Alkari looks for potential traps inside the castle and warns Li not to enter via castle gates because of the presence of deadly traps potent enough to kill a dragon. Jessica declares she knows a secret entry to the Frost Castle, which is a large underground evacuation shelter. She predicts a large number of servivores present there. Since Taemin is also a barbarian class like Jessica, he also lends his hand in entering the castle, while Lee sees the gauge of survivors depleting in his status window.